Hi guys, this is Kim Pullen, and welcome to our first evening edition, the PM edition of Lunchtime Live here at Hope for Spouses. So I'm really glad you guys can make it tonight. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about a very sem sensitive subject to all of us who are mothers. And it's when, you know, we know, we know how we feel about the devastation of our spouse's sexual betrayal in our marriage and our life, but what about the impact on our children? What about the way our kids think about family, marriage, God, all that? Like, what is the impact on our kids? So what we're going to talk about today is first we're going to talk about how living with a sexually addicted um, father or husband, uh, the kids seeing their father in their life, how that affects a child emotionally and spiritually in their development, how it affects them as adults, how it affects their view of God, and then how you as a wife and a mother can minimize these devastating effects, okay? So I want to introduce myself for those of you, this is your first time uh, visiting us in the Lunchtime Live studios. Uh, my name is Kim Pullen, and I am the founder and creator of Hope for Spouses. And I did it because my husband and I went through a very traumatic situation in our lives where my husband committed adultery multiple times, and we actually separated. We were separated for four years while I worked on dealing with my stuff, and he worked on dealing with his stuff. And so it was very, very traumatic. But we've been back together now for three years, and we have a marriage that is amazing. I could never even have dreamed it would be this good. But my heart really reaches out to women who, who who have are still in the middle of all of their pain, of all of their struggles. And I do this because I want to give you hope that when we really look to God's word, when we really deal with ourselves honestly, when we're really willing to change and become the, the strong, godly women that God designed us to be and really set up those boundaries and um, really uphold God's truth from the scriptures, that real, real change can happen in our lives. So let me just define what sexual addiction is. So sexual addiction is when uh, a person, whether it's a man or a woman, views pornography on a consistent basis, and they basically can't stop doing it. And it also includes masturbation. So if they're masturbating to porn or if they're just watching it and they literally can't stop themselves from watching it, that is when it becomes sexual addiction. It's also when adultery happens multiple times. If it's just one, it could be... Uh, I'll, for lack of a better term, a fluke, but if it continues multiple times, then it becomes sexual addiction. Now, it doesn't make that one time any less painful, uh, but just so you know the difference between what sexual addiction is and what a single, a single aspect or a single event of adultery is. Now, it doesn't matter whether your kids are 2 or 22. There are long-term implications on all of their current relationships and their future relationships in wake of their dad's sexual betrayal to you, their mom, okay? So in other words, they're not just betraying you, okay? They are betraying your whole family. They are betraying your friends. They are betraying your, uh, betraying your church. They are betraying your community. And most importantly, they are betraying God. So the ramifications are impactful. They're long-term. Okay, so how does sexual addiction impact your children? Well, it, it impacts them mentally, it impacts them emotionally, and, and in the long run, it can actually even impact them physically. And that's not even if there, there's any kind of abuse that goes on as far as like sexual abuse with the children, but just what, they're, what the kids see at home has that much of a devastating impact on them. Now, if you're just coming in and you are here because you are concerned about your own kids, I want you to go ahead and put a, you know, put your name in, in, in the comment section. As I go through these examples of what happens to a child, what the impact is on that, and if you see any of these behaviors, I want you to just put your name in there and just let me know like what it is you see and why it is so concerning to you. Okay. So as a child, what happens is children learn from the disrespectful behaviors or remarks about gender and sexuality, okay? So they start seeing these comments as normal. For example, there was a, a I was talking to um, a spouse, and she was saying that her husband was actually saying to her eight-year-old son that a real man has, 
has more than one woman. A real man has a lot of women in his life. And it's like, that's what this kid is hearing. That's what he's hearing from his father, his dad, who is his role model. So this dad is teaching his son that it's okay to be promiscuous. It's okay. In fact, it is, it is manly to have more than one woman and to, you know, to not be faithful to your wife. That's what he's teaching his son. So it, it develops a warped sense of what this child really knows, what, what God says is real healthy masculinity, okay? And also what happens is these children experience shame or confusion about their body, about gender, and about sexuality. And, and we really see this, um, we see this in boys, but we also see it a lot in girls because their father, uh, the way he talks about women, uh, there's a shaming that goes along with it, that there's a confusion of how they should feel about their body, how they should feel about their gender, um, whether that the girls should be able to be treated that way. And so there's this confusion that goes on that, especially if they're going to church and they're hearing one thing from the pulpit, and then they're seeing something very different in their house, it really sends some confusion and even some shame about how they look at their own bodies and how they view themselves. And then sex tends to be viewed in extremes in these kind of households. So uh, either sex is all important or it's dirty, it's disgusting, it's naughty. And it's not handled in a godly way. God intended sex to be a beautiful thing between a husband and wife. It's a way to show love to one another. It's a way to develop this deeper intimacy that God intended for the sexual relationship to have. God wrote a whole book on it. He allowed Song of Solomon. It's one of the most beautiful uh, pieces of poetry that you could possibly read about the intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. And so God had a plan for what sex was supposed to be. But when sexual addiction gets in there, when pornography, when adultery gets in there, it totally distort, distorts what God intended for it to be. Children also can experience an atmosphere of secrecy or duplicity, duplicity about sex. It's, it's sneaky. And so therefore, there's this intrigue about it that the kids get enticed to. And so they, in turn, may be enticed themselves later on in life. They have access to pornography that, that they shouldn't have access to. Access to. And, and that could be in the form, like maybe they're looking at their dad's phone or they're looking at their dad's computer and the pornography just pops up because the, the, the father was looking at pornography themselves. And so you get all these pop-ups that come up and the kid's getting bombarded by these images. And that actually halts their emotional development. It just sends too much confusion into their poor little minds that they cannot handle it, overwhelms their senses. And they cannot handle it. Okay, and, and when there's sexual um, sexual addiction in the home, there's also a lack of teaching a child what healthy, nourishing touch looks like. Because touch is always associated with sex. And so they never really learn what healthy touch is. And that is especially damaging to, to these children because as as older, you know, as I'm sorry, as boys, boys start thinking that, that they can be rough. That they can be that, that that that's man that's that's what manliness is. That's what a husband really does. Is they can be rough and harsh and sexual in a way that they touch, that they can um, touch little girls behind, and and that's normal, healthy touching, and that's not right. That's not of God. But then um, the the girl starts feeling like that's what she should expect to be felt like, and so those are not nourishing touches. Hugs, healthy, pure hugs. Loving up on a child, those are nourishing. That's what the children need to see in order, in order for them to really understand what nourishing and healthy touch is really all about. And one of the things that really hurts me more than anything else is really seeing how children start viewing God the way that they see their dad. Because the, their fathers are their first image of what, a, what the father in heaven really is like. And so the way that they view their dad, with how they see their dad, the picture that their dad paints for them, is how they start seeing God as a child. And so if their father is faithless to their mother, well, what's the child going to think? That God is faithless to us. That, that if he's a liar, he's a manipulator, well, that's the way God is. That God isn't really sincere. God isn't really interested in how we really feel. And they get this warped identity of who God is. That God just uses us and disposes of us. And that is so opposite of what God really is, but that's what the children, that's what they replicate. 
So if you've seen any of those, just jot it, you know, make a note in the comments because I want to come back to that. And then as the children grow up, these effects impact their adulthood. They in fact their current relationships, they impact their future relationships. So as an adult, what ends up happening is they repeat what they saw in childhood. They repeat what they saw when they were kids in their home. They don't know any difference. That's what is normal. Okay? Now, I grew up in a home that was dysfunctional. I thought it was normal. My father was a drug smuggler. I thought it was normal. It wasn't until I was an adult and I really started understanding, oh my gosh, my family was so dysfunctional. But that's what I that's all that I knew, that's all I understood. But it's when I became an adult, that's when the ramifications, that's when these impacts really came out because it confused how I view what a healthy relationship with a man was like. So children can actually grow up and become addicts. What they see in their parents is what they replicate. So they become addicts. They become codependents because it's all that they know. They experience confusion, discomfort, and terror in the face of sexuality. They don't know how to handle it. They don't know how to process it because they never saw it. They have a difficulty establishing intimate relationships because they don't know what intimacy even looks like. All they've seen is a warped view of it. And so they, in turn, have a hard time having a healthy, intimate relationship with another person. Either they're abusive themselves, and that's what they view as, 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 as healthy, as sexual, as manly, or as, as womanly. And, you know, women can really just endure this abuse because that's what they saw their mother doing at home. They ex experience this fear or shame when they should experience healthy sexual relationships. They don't know how to handle. Once they get married, that there's dysfunction in their sexual relationship with their spouse because they don't know how to have a healthy one. That, that their sexual relationship is, is, um, is warped, it's messed up. They can't be comfortable. They can't give to their spouse in the way that God intended them for them because they, didn't, they, they don't know what that even begins to look like. So they start misidentifying the role of sex in relationships and they use it to avoid abandonment. They use it to control others or to fill an emptiness inside that's not meant to be filled by sex, okay? But they can also confuse sex with emotional intimacy. And see, most of us, when we think of the term intimacy, we think sex, but it's not. Sex is a fruit of intimacy, but we can confuse the sexual act. We can confuse pornography. We can confuse adultery with what emotional intimacy is, and they're not the same. They have nothing to do with each other. Sex is sex if it's not with emotional intimacy attached to it. It's just a it's, it's brute beasts, you know. Having sex, you know, replicating, you know, um, producing something, but it's not of God. All right. So, biblical view. Okay. How does God do this? All right. So, in Ephesians six four. God very specifically directs fathers to don't exasperate your children. Bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. So obviously, if a father is actively practicing sexual addiction, you know, viewing pornography and adultery, he's going to exasperate his children because he's not teaching them what's right. So he's violating a very specific commandment from God. One of the other things that ends up happening is it gets, what gets passed on is what's called a generational sin. In Deuteronomy 5, 8 through 10, it says that the Lord says, I am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. So what does that mean? Does that mean God is going to punish your children because their father was a sex addict? Because that's what they learned? No. But what ends up happening is your children, when they don't learn these healthy practices about sexual, about what sex is and what sexuality is, they replicate this and they end up paying the consequences for it. And then their children pay the consequences for it. And it goes on and on until that chain has got to be broken. And the only way it can be broken is with God's word. Okay? So the, the punishment is there. But God says that he shows love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments and that is keeping the marriage bed pure that is keeping the marriage pure in god's eyes and so god blesses that and so it's simply a replication of what we see god doesn't want to punish that 
but that is the consequences of sin when we choose to do that. So what, is it, what does it also do? It teaches kids that God is hypocritical. When we see our when the kids see their father and, and, and him doing things that is not from maybe, if they're going to church and they're hearing something from the pulpit and their dad is not doing it and their dad is going to church, so it teaches kids that God lets people get away with stuff like that. God, God isn't real. God doesn't have any power. God is powerless. And so they don't look to God for real transformation. They look to themselves. They look to the world to really find fulfillment to, for, for answers. Okay, And that teaches them that church is full of hypocrites. Because if their father is doing this behind closed doors, then God must not see it, so God is not powerful. You see how it distorts the mind of the way that children can, can be? I mean, it's no wonder that, that young people are leaving today's churches in droves. 66% of Christian men view pornography on a monthly basis, and 35% of them have admitted to having an affair. So, I mean, that's, that's in, the, in the churches. And if that is happening, it's no wonder our kids are leaving. They see right through this stuff. So, of course, they see it. Of course, they're not going to have faith because they see hypocrisy going on in their homes and in their churches, and they don't believe that God has the power to do anything about it. All right. So um, I'm just going to look at a question here. I think my son's um, older sons may have issues with respect for their father still, even though he has was open with the mistakes as if they're, we are now reconciling a year and a half. Yeah. The long-term ramifications, it's really hard for the kids to recover from this, even when um, the, the there's repentance. The kids have to heal. There's a lot of damage that's done. When my husband and I were separated, fortunately our kids were younger. Um, my daughters, uh, when my husband and I were reconciled, my oldest daughter was 14. And they were able to reconcile their relationship. And now they have a great relationship. But it took like two and a half to three years for, the, for them to really be able to do that. And really seeing dad being exactly what he said he was going to be, that he was completely transparent with his life. And, and the way that he treats me has a huge impact on the way my girls really view what godly repentance looks like and, and the way that God um, way that God really is. They see a man who's really changed. So what can you do to minimize this impact? Okay. First of all, you have to... You have to accept the fact that damage is being done or the damage has already been done. It's there. You have to be honest with your kids in an age-appropriate way. You can't lie to them. You can't pretend nothing's happening. At the same time, you can't dump on them. They can't be your accountability partner. They can't be your best friend at this. Okay, the kids, they're, they're not equipped to handle this. Okay, our frontal lobes aren't even fully developed till we're 25. So there's things that they literally can't handle. But you can be honest with them that, that their daddy has sinned. I mean, if you and your spouse are separated, the kids need to understand that daddy has made bad choices. You need to be very honest. You need to be more concerned about protecting your children's salvation than your husband's reputation. So, and that's what I was with my girls. I was very honest with my girls what was going on. My youngest one didn't really understand it. She just knew daddy wasn't living here anymore. I have an autistic son. He didn't understand it as well. But my, my oldest daughter, she got it. And she really understood what was happening. But I, but I communicated in a way that I wasn't disrespectful toward my husband. And I didn't communicate it. But they saw the pain that I was going through. They heard me crying in my closet on a regular basis. They knew that their dad had hurt me. And that he had made bad choices. And that's what I called him. He had chosen to please himself and to not please God. And I communicated when the kids, they saw me when I was unhappy. They saw me when I was, when I was hurt. I wasn't going to hide it from them because they were going to pick it up anyway. I wasn't going to be a hypocrite. Now, I was very guarded as far as how much I let them know. I got a lot of advice from wise counsel and to, to how much that I really could communicate to them. But I wanted them to know. And I made sure they spent time with their dad because I knew how important it was for girls to really connect with their fathers. But it was hard. It was really, really hard. So we have to also teach our kids uh, about healthy sexuality based on what the scriptures teach about purity, about what God intends for marriage. We, if our spouses are not going to do that, then we have to do it. We have to pick up the slack that our spouses didn't do. And so we have to make sure that we are going to the scriptures to be able to find those answers. 
there's some really great books um, on, on how God views, um, to how to teach a child about sex and how God views a healthy sexuality in marriage and, and what God's design and plan for it is. But you have to be the one teaching your children about purity, about faithfulness, about righteousness. If your husband is not doing that, if he's not being a godly example, then you need to do that. So you need to be more concerned about your children's salvation than your spouse's reputation. Because there, in 1 Timothy 5, 20, 524, it says that the sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them, but the sin of others trail behind them. Your, your spouse's sin is not going to stay hidden. It's going to come out one way or the other. Psalm 98 even says that all secret sin is laid before God. We can't hide it. God sees it. It's going to come out one way or another. Okay? So the most important thing you can do is work on yourself. We always hear this thing when you're in an airplane and the airplane's going to go down and those little oxygen masks come. you got to put the mask on yourself first, okay, before you put it on your children. Same thing applies here. you got to work on yourself first. You got to deal with your own self. So you can't leave your kids anywhere that you haven't gone. So you have to have a healthy view of what sexuality is. You have to have a healthy view of what what a healthy relationship with a spouse, dealing with codependency. Okay? Because addiction and codependency is hereditary. You pass it on to your children if you do not nip it in the bud. If you not are, are not aggressively striving to teach your kids what godliness is in a marriage, your kids are going to repeat the same pattern. We have to break those chains, okay? So you need to be scared for your kids. I'm scared for your kids, but I want them to have a biblical example of what that looks like. So if you don't know how to do that with your kids, because you haven't done it with yourself, if you need to deal with yourself first, then I want you to give me a call. But I only want you to call me if you're really serious about changing, because I only work with a, a very small group of people who are really serious, who are not going to let anything stop them, okay? Sometimes we won't do things for ourselves. As women, as moms, we always put everybody before ourselves. But we're talking about your kids here. We're talking about their future. We're talking about them ending up in counseling. We're talking about them ending up in therapy. We're talking about them ending up in divorce. If you want to break that cycle, if you want to have any chance of your kids having healthy relationships in the future, you've got to deal with yourself. So if you're serious about it, I want you to set up a call with me. You can go to uh, hopeforspouses.com slash apply. Again, that's hopeforspouses.com slash apply. It takes about 45 minutes. I'll give you clarity. We'll get the truth. Sometimes it doesn't feel so good, but we're going to get you there. Okay? All right, guys. That's about it for now. Thanks for stopping in and, and listening to the Hope for Spouses Lunchtime Live. Oh, can you mention about how the Bible mentions men as leading their families? Um, I'm going to go ahead and put that in the comment section, Colleen. So I'll, I'll uh, give you a, a scripture in the comment section later. Okay? So we'll talk to you guys uh, next Tuesday. We're going to have our next Lunchtime Live at 1215 here on Hope for Spouses. Take out. Or take care.